Another movement that I would say is potentially pretty advanced, something that I probably wouldn't touch within the first couple of years of doing plyometrics. I'm Matt McInnes Watson, owner of Plus Plies, my coach, educator, and lover of all things dynamic and fast. Today we're digging into this Russian compilation of plyometrics. Group of world-class high jumpers. I'm pretty sure the men were over two meters 30. So what's that, seven, seven for you Americans. And it shows some of their general training, of which is a lot of dynamic jumping plyometrics and some, I'd say some more explosive strength-based movements. I've got to take my hat off to Joel Smith for uploading this to his YouTube. I think it was around 11, 12 years ago. I constantly go back to this. I feel there's so much value in it. And I think you should check it out before you maybe look at the rest of this video. It'll give you an idea as to what this looks like. So that's gonna be linked down in the bio below. So we start this video with really what is world-class high jumping. We've got some old straddles in there. We've got probably some 230 to 235, 240 high jumps in there. Great shot of Arta Partika as well, guy that jumped 240. But what it actually does is it freezes in one of these uh, videos of these high jumpers and it looks at the forces on a single leg. And then it kind of quickly relates back to that in some of the movements that they're doing. So they're kind of saying, here's the sort of forces that you're gonna receive here's how we train to be able to deal with those forces, which obviously should be your number one focus when it comes to coaching, when it comes to figuring out why and how you should be programming things for your athletes. So that's your, your number one. What's your needs analysis for this stuff? Why are you using plyometrics? Or what should you be using to complete the specific skills that you're using in your sport? So we see some Russian... There, I'm not sure exactly what it's saying, but quickly it shows you the movements that they found most valuable. And a lot of these are high-speed plyometrics. So straight out of the gates, we see this static three or four bounds into the pit, and it really goes to show how important they value single leg or unilateral plyometrics. One of them is a, a depth jump over a hurdle on a single leg. So you might call it like a depth jump into a hurdle hop, which is hugely intense, but I think it writes to a lot of other movements that they do within this video. So we see this as well. We see this single leg leg presses and the single leg leg presses then move into those calf raises. And really it's quite a lightweight and pretty dynamic, but you might see some value in that. It could be just some just some basic work for the quads and how they push through the foot. Um, it's moving quite quickly. It seems like there's quite high repetition, but we're trying to move the, the weight fast. Is that really relevant? Could you be using other strength means? Potentially, I would say that you're probably gonna use a lot more heavier compound lifts at this point. I'm not saying that leg pressing is bad, but I personally would rather go to a, a back squat or if we're looking at a single leg movement, maybe you're using a more of a step up variation to get that same extension pattern. Now, my, my eyes kind of first cast to, to this movement here, which is the, the hops on and off of a ascending setup of boxes. So each box gets higher. Now, an interesting part of this is that I think this is is really quite uh, an eccentrically focused based movement. Like the need to get up onto the box obviously is there, but then straight away it's about falling from a higher height and overloading that eccentric portion quite quickly, which is obviously gonna be fantastic when it comes to having to deal with these really high eccentric loads. So not only would you have to deal with that in the high jump, but you might see it in basic cutting actions. You might see it when you wanna jump up to a hoop in basketball. Um, so these things straight away show us that we're trying to build um, system stiffness, have a, a real fast loading of the overall system and being able to deal with those forces at speed. I would say that the boxes are also there just as a way to 
dampen the forces of the next seg off. So it's quite singular in nature. So it's that individual focus on and off of a box. You're not trying to continuously hop one after the other after the other, but you're using that external stimuli as something that is going to regulate the heights that you're falling from to give you the eccentric load that you potentially want to stimulate with. Now, where I might go with this is how relevant is this to someone that is starting out? Probably not that relevant. I'd probably say this is quite an advanced movement and it's hard to program for different cohorts of athletes. So it might be a case that, I don't know, maybe you use smaller boxes, maybe you use just a smaller sequence of boxes. It could be just plates. You could, you could lay down a, a super thin plate that might be 10 pounds and eventually you get to a 45 and that could be your like baby version of it. You know, you, you could stack it higher and higher and whatever and that might show you progress. What you could also do as well is if you wanted to, is where things get tasty, and maybe you're observing this, is let's say three or four in, you start to observe that a certain athlete spends a lot more time on the ground. This maybe shows that they struggle to create the stiffness. Maybe they're also then showing that there's a lot more flexion at that joint, and therefore they struggle with the eccentric loading. Maybe it's too fast for them because of the height that they're falling from. Why not chuck a, something like a plyo mat underneath that? Why not film it, see the details? Mm, this is looking a little bit slower, let's test it. Chuck a plyo mat underneath there. By the way, the only testing mat that you should ever use is a plyo mat. And see if the ground contact times are a lot slower. And then you could chuck it back a couple. Okay, no, you're, you're able to keep it, let's say below 0.22. But this one, it goes to 0.26. That might be a great way to test whether something is maybe just too much. It's okay maybe to keep it at 0 0.23, 0 0.24 but anything over that, things start to diminish. So that's a good one, quite like that movement. I don't think it's necessarily for everyone, but it's something that you can quite easily overload the system eccentrically with. Now what follows this is, it's just a really great group of what Verka Chansey termed as plyometric actions. And plyometric actions are really all locomotive plyometrics that you see, so you've got bounding and hopping and leaping off of two feet. And really it's about just locomotive practices. It's about continually propelling yourself along. It's not necessarily what he deemed as true plyometrics, but they are an action that is plyometric. And we see a lot of bounding here. We see a lot of hopping here. What first initially sparks my interest with some of these plyometric actions are we have quite a lot of incline-based plyos. The first one that you see is bounding uphill. What I'd suggest here is that these incline bounds are probably a focus of trying to feel that push and extension out the back of the athlete. So we're not having to, to work so much on movement in front. Obviously that's gonna be there and it becomes a lot faster in terms of how quickly it comes at you when you're working on an incline. So it's all about just pushing through that slope. Now, depending on how you wanna put this in yourself, it's always suggested in my my case, I think to not exceed anything, if you're doing a really quite a large amplitude based movement, so a plus bias system would be a medium or ping tier, then I would suggest focusing on it being no more than like a 10 to 15 degree slope. Obviously that's really hard. And it looks like in this video, this slope has specifically been built at the track facility. But if you're going outside and a hill looks like you're, you're climbing Kilimanjaro, then it's probably too steep to be doing high amplitude forms of plyometrics here. So keep the focus on it being maybe a slightly lower incline gradient. And really we don't want movements to be at detriment with regards to the, the kinematics that happen. So ground contact time shouldn't really diminish that much. It's probably a change of 10 to 15%. So if you're going uphill, you're probably gonna be spending more time on the ground. Downhill, you potentially, into a, to a certain degree, will be able to actually minimize ground contact time. You don't have to spend so much time on the ground and you're kind of tumbling down. So you see uphill or incline-based plyometrics again here. You see that all three of them are hopping together. This is a beautiful sequence of, of a, a group of really world-class track and field athletes hopping uphill or with an incline. And you can see the gradient is not too steep here. It probably is around that 10 degree mark. 
Now, why would they use hopping uphill? Personally, I think that Obviously, they're still working the extension part. They're still working at trying to create that impulse just for slightly longer. But also, where it gets a little bit more interesting than bounding is the cyclical need to whip the leg down. And it's more apparent, obviously, in hopping because you're just using one leg. So it's actually going to teach the extension pattern has to be strong there to propel them up the incline. But also, the need to whip the leg down and then push through the ground is super high. So there's a focus there that I think is super valuable. Um, obviously, I think a lot of athletes can bound on an incline. Hopping is definitely something that I would focus on on the flat, I'd say for the first year in terms of using plyometrics. So if you've never used plyometrics truly within your program, give it some time and I'd probably put that in at a later stage. Now, we see incline movements come back in, and I think, I mean, you do see some relative amplitude to what this guy is doing up the incline when he does these bounds uphill. What I quite like about it is that he actually maintains a pretty solid foot. So, in terms of ankle stiffness, these are great, like, and the incline is super steep. I'd, to hazard a guess, I'd say it's at least 35, maybe 30 degrees. And he actually keeps the heel off the ground here. You're probably not gonna get a lot of these in, like volume wise, it's gonna be really tough on the lower leg to maintain that level of stiffness and really expose that lower leg tissue. Because the more we're up on the forefoot there, the more likely it's gonna place a lot of stress on those lower legs. So whilst the rest of the big movers in the body, like your hips, hamstrings, quads, and glutes and so on, they're probably not gonna be as fatigued doing these like much steeper incline based movements, but the lower leg is gonna get a big hit. So if you wanna improve ankle stiffness, I would say these are great for acceleration work. So if you wanna improve that, um, that lower leg stiffness of attacking down, maintaining that position of the ankle and not collapsing, these are great for that. And he displays that really well. Now what's really cool is then to see just how much harder he finds maintaining stiffness when he hops. This is actually, I think, the same athlete that hops then uphill. So he's just using a, a single leg to propel himself up that hill. But what do you see? You don't see the same level of ankle sniffers that you did in the bounds. Now, it just shows one side and it literally shows three hops. But we make an assumption here, maybe it's something that's a little bit too intense with the amplitude and incline that he's using. What would I do? I'd probably say just reduce the, the amplitude down. If, if this is the, the focus, obviously, in maintaining ankle stiffness, I would say reduce the amplitude down and I would make it a smaller hop, but can you maintain the ankle stiffness that you did in the bounds? So another good movement, another movement that I would say is potentially pretty advanced something that I probably wouldn't touch within the first couple of years of doing plyometrics, but it could be a great addition later on. And like I said, for accelerating purposes, these are pretty tasty. So further into the video, we see more hopping variations. So we've seen that light incline, steep incline hop, but we also see what might be deemed as more shock method based hopping. What I mean by that is Verkashansky saw depth jumps or the shock method of depth jumping as something that should be in excess of around 60 or 70 centimeters. So looking at two and a half feet there to fall from. And what he was looking for us to work on there is more explosive strength. It's not reactive strength, working at lower boxes and it being as stiff and as fast as possible, but actually dealing with extremely high muscular stiffness. And, and actually a step up from that was um, more maximal strength based shock method, which was in excess of one meter or up to one meter 10, which is closer to three and a half feet. So we see a couple of what I would say shock method hopping actions here. And the first one is actually hurdle hops. And it looks like they're close to the maximum height for men, which is three foot six. Now, why I say these are more shock method, but it's because they, they do seem a lot more of an explosive strength-based movement. What we see, we see a lot more flexion at the knee and at the hip 
than we do with those locomotive forms. Even when they're moving uphill, I don't think that this guy's as flex as he is when he goes over these hurdles. He spends a lot more time on the ground here, which isn't necessarily a detrimental thing, but actually it is just stressing the musculature to create stiffness a lot more to deal with this higher amplitude of force and having to deal with creating a lot more strength around those major joints. So we have this version of what I would say would be called hops for height. The next one that's shown then are some hurdle hops for distance. And actually, although they aren't quite as slow on the ground as the ones for height, I think that there is a level of horizontal force that also may deem it as more explosive strength there. So I really like those. Obviously they are super advanced, but if you are looking to integrate them into your program with more beginners, then what you can do is take those hurdles away and make the stimulus based on just the intent of how you would try to attack it. So I'm talking to my athlete, little Joey, Joey, I want you to hop for height, but I want you to hop for height to a level where you can handle doing three or four or five of these in a row. I don't want there to be one high, one where you're trying to control it and you're losing position. I want there to be a continuous effort. So little Joey might do a couple of sets of those and they're all over the place. Right, bring it down. Your hops for height now need to be at 60 or 70% of intensity. And that's the way that I would chase out. Do the same for horizontal as well. Okay, let's say that you are gonna hop for distance. And the first one you're gonna try to go over, let's say two feet or 60 centimeters. Maybe that becomes too much. So we're gonna reduce that down and you're just going to make sure that you're maintaining momentum and not completely losing it. Now, just some other standout points. We do see a lot of very simple, I'd say compound Olympic based movements a lot, of the, a lot of the movements are pretty lightweight. There's a lot of speed to these. And what's interesting that it kind of conflicts what we, what we talk about in modern day, it's actually the high repetition of these movements. Now, if I was to, we would kind of argue against it now is that, you know, we understand that if we want intent, we want low repetitions and we want, depending on what we're trying to train, if we're training more absolute strength, obviously that load is gonna be significantly higher, the bar's gonna be moving significantly slower. If we wanna train more velocity-based means, then obviously the weight is gonna be significantly lower, but we are gonna maintain speed as we do that. So where I see that there's actual, actually some positivity in high repetition, light bar, is actually the relax and contract techniques that come with it, is we see this smooth action. It's bum, 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 bum. So there's a step up version here. This guy's using a light weight, boom, boom, steps up. And again, boom, boom. Yeah, so another version was seeing this athlete doing kind of repetitive hang snatches. And it's just boom, up, drop, up, drop, up. And you see those three repetitions. He maintains speed, but he also maintains the speed and the rhythm in which he's doing it. So it might be different to how we're lifting at the moment. Is there more to that just contract and relax idea? Maybe there is. I personally am not necessarily using that for a lot of the jumpers that I am coaching, but maybe that's something that I'll look to implement. And then the final piece is, we also see a lot of incline bilateral movements here. So the first one we see is like a real ankle dominant incline. Again, they're using this super high incline um, and it looks like there's, it's very lower extremity base. So you can see in the movement, there's really not too much heel drop in the way that they continually propel themselves up. They maintain that position of the foot, but obviously there is that incline. So we're right up on that forefoot and it is very ankle dominant in just pushing up that slope. Now where you see it again is with more slower, I would say there's almost more, more like broad jumping uphill. Um, so it, it kind of looks here that there's like a triple broad jump as they move up that incline. And, and what does it tell me? Again, there's some great ankle stiffness work here. I really like how as the guy drops his shins forward, 
And what's fascinating is he actually matches almost the, the inclined slope. So as that inclined slope is, let's say it's at 30, 35 degrees, as he rolls over the foot, the shin also kind of matches that angle, which is fantastic, obviously. And the best part of all is that he really maintains great ankle stiffness as he rolls over the shin. And you see that he gets that shin rolls forward and we then get hip extension that finishes off at the top. And he recovers quite nicely in time for him then to be able to push back through the floor. Again, I actually think that many athletes can probably use this training means. I don't think that it's necessarily too advanced for most people. I like to add these sorts of movements in. My ability to do it up here was obviously limited. Ways in which you could implement it without an incline, and this goes the same for all the incline-based movements, is just do it band resisted. So you have a partner or you can strap it to a, a, a fence or a wall or whatever, and that partner might walk along with you and actually they just create a little bit of resistance. Not too much resistance, they still wanna be moving. That's why I always suggest doing it with a partner. You maybe attach a couple woody bands. If you're privileged enough to have a 1080 or a pulley system, then you can always put a little bit of resistance. And I would say, honestly, it shouldn't be any more than like 10 to 15% body weight on that. Obviously that's a little bit more difficult when you're doing band assisted, but you can still give it a try and just work on those real important components that we spoke about, which was extension out the back and maintaining stiffness through the lower extremity. So really, we see a few other leaping actions here. We see some simple on and off of boxes in the same way that I looked at the hopping variations of where they increase with time, obviously working that eccentric component. We see a lot of typical hurdle leaps, bilateral landings over hurdles. And these are great. This is overall system stiffness. We're getting a taste of more eccentric focused, more concentric focused, more kind of in the middle where we're trying to create as much reactivity. We're getting a little bit more explosive work. We're getting a little bit more reactive work. And really what is so valuable about this video is there's a smorgasbord of different amplitudes, rhythms, intensities, and ways in which they are still trying to hit the ground and leave it. And I think an athlete that has the ability to do all of those things effectively is someone that is super robust and has a lot to offer when it comes to the specifics of the sport. So final thoughts on it. I think everyone should be doing more of these movements that are seen in this video. A lot of you probably already are, but you should be looking at these, these movements and saying, how can I make it relevant to the population that I'm training? Maybe it is reducing down the intensity. Maybe it is taking away an external stimuli and really focusing on how you can fit it towards your situation and how you can eventually get to this level of plyometric work. Maybe it doesn't need to get all the way to the super explosive depth jumping that you see here or the hurdle hops, but can it look like this for a lot more team sports athletes that you coach? Thanks for listening, guys. I'm gonna be doing a load more of these videos, so stay tuned. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. And go to possibilize.com if you want the best plyometric training program on the planet. Thank you.